Next, we have um, user experience for trustable products with Amy Elliott. She's the design director at Simply Secure. Simply Secure is a nonprofit which empowers practitioners to build trustworthy technology through professional education and research. Okay, okay. good. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Amy, um, pixelated photo, green dot. I know this is uh, being recorded, but you're also welcome to photograph me or tweet at me or reach out to me other, in other ways. Uh, I work with Simply Secure. Simply Secure is a, a US-based nonprofit that focuses on privacy, security, transparency, and ethics. I'm based here in Berlin. I've been here about 18 months. Um, and part of that is just forming new connections with different people in the community. The communities that Simply Secure is targeting are designers, developers, researchers, and users. I'm a designer, and I'm here to talk kind of more specifically about ways that design can protect privacy and build trust. So um, there are three kind of main topics that I want to want to hit: uh, threat models, better basics, and new frontiers. Looking um, with a user experience lens, a UX lens, at challenges of security, privacy, and trust. So who you're worried about having your data depends on your threat model. So up here are kind of four general characters uh, that people are con concerned about getting um, unauthorized access to their, their data. Um, hackers, many people here in this room may identify as hackers and, and, and you know, have more of a white hat mentality, but when you look at things like wanna cry, when you look at ransomware, um, there's a lot of um, shorthand just in popular speech around like, oh, the hackers from the unfavorable country of the moment are going to um, you know, get my stuff and make me pay to get it back. So governments and companies is, is pretty straightforward. I think which of those two you're more concerned about probably is influenced um, on your geography and, and on your, your demographics. Um, I uh, spent 20 years um, of, of my career in, in Silicon Valley living and, and working in, um, in San Francisco and kind of came up through a culture that uh, was very strongly positive about um, companies and uh, pretty skeptical or hostile to uh, the government. And it's been very interesting for me to come to a European context or a Berlin context where there's generally high trust and respect um, for the government and hostility or skepticism uh, for companies. But it's not as simple as an either or. I, I wanna explicitly make space um, for stalkers and talk about intimate partner violence. Uh, I think that's true. Um, financial control is uh, definitely a vector of abuse. So people who are, are thinking about financial privacy um, it is a, a naive and unrealistic to think that everyone within the, the confines of their own home or dwelling actually has um, safety. So uh, there, are, there are implications for meeting the needs of that audience as well. Um, so looping back to this connection um, or contradiction between the government and, and hackers, looking with a U.S. lens, um, I mentioned a bit of my kind of uh, personal experience in coming out of the U.S. I think there's a, a misconception that um, in um, November of 2016, the United States got a new president, and then during the course of last year, everything changed. And, and that's a misconception. I mean, the, these processes and these arguments and, and these stories are fairly old. And as one clear example, this is something from, um, uh, looks like a BuzzFeed News, and um, this is about Twitter and national security letters um, back in 2014, where um, during the uh, Obama administration, Twitter uh, was taking a stance about pushing back against what they saw as um, governmental overreach. So um, nowadays, I think some of the US climate is definitely thinking more about tech companies as a possible force that could stand against um, the United States government. And specific kind of arenas for thinking about this are um, you know, people that reside in, in Europe are now being asked to 
or other parts of the world too, not just Europe, are being asked to hand over social media information in order to um, be able to enter the United States as part of um, what's being called um, extreme vetting um, of visitors. And the um, immigration customs enforcement is also um, a police force. So there are currently 20,000-ish um, people who work as um, ICE um, border control agents, and that number is expected to grow um, significantly over the course of this year. And um, the Trump administration has been very clear about giving um, more uh, uh, discretion and autonomy to this police force in the field in terms of the methods they use and um, how they do um, their work. But the reality today is that in the United States, there's a police force affiliated with customs that goes around arresting people. And uh, digital media and digital, our digital footprints are one input that they are using. So um, last year, I did some field work um, in, in San Francisco, and I was looking at um, shopping apps, um, money-saving apps, and um, the, the kinds of uh, things that you might have on your smartphone that are, are ways that you have a um, loyalty, your loyalty card for Starbucks, for example. And one of the really interesting quotes that stuck with me was this interview with this guy who had um, a completely unambiguously Muslim name. Like, think something like, you know, Muhammad Islam. And just, he was, in the context of talking about shopping, retail, marketing, and databases, was talking about ways in which his name is this completely um, big red flashing sign about his identity and in and, and ways that he's expected to answer and justify. And despite his concerns about um, anything from discrimination to actual harm, he really felt that he had no choice but to use these services. And that these services that he had no choice were not um, what someone might consider a uh, lower down the technology stack like you know, email or Wi-Fi. They were, they were literally things like the Starbucks coffee app. And um, he had a very kind of well articulated set of reasons as all these people did around why the, this, these pieces of um, commercial transactions were, ne were necessary. And, um, you know, in Berlin, cash is still very popular. It's um, an ongoing source of frustration for me that the money machine near my house only dispenses 50 euro notes, which none of the people, uh, shops are in the radius of that are willing to take um, before a certain time of, of day. Um, and it, it's just uh, this kind of extra thing that needs to be managed. And uh, in San Francisco right now, cash is not so popular. And many of the people who patronized shops, such as Starbucks, felt that using apps was more ethical. And the reason that they felt that that was more ethical is that there's no way to tip if you only just pay or touch with a card. The only way that you have to give kind of extra discretionary service money um, to the baristas at Starbucks or to these other people was through the apps. So these were socially minded people that are doubling down and increasing their investment in these proprietary apps in the name of social good and equality. So that, that's, that's not a story that's true around the globe, but I'll just say that again because it's kind of counterintuitive. In San Francisco, I encountered people that believed they had no choice but to use things like the Starbucks app because they believe in social equality. So um, that was a little bit about um, you know, the, the threat models that you're, uh, that you're concerned about, governments, intimate partners, companies, or hackers. I'm going to talk a little bit about what some better basics are that we could do as a community uh, to better uh, protect people's privacy. So um, I don't read Chinese, and uh, these, these uh, images are getting dated. If you're into WeChat, this probably seems very like, I don't even know, 2005. Um, it's a graphic from Dan Grover, who um, used to work for WeChat in China. So I, I call this kind of locks of the Chinese internet. And the point here is beyond usability, there needs to be real meaning here. And it's very easy to sit in Berlin and, and, and scoff and say, like, well, what do these locks even mean? Um, you know, if, if all network traffic is being intercepted in red, this is just a, a, this lock is meaningless. And that is a fair point. As a UX designer, I can make a lock. 
I can have um, a GIF with two states, and one state is open, and then you click on it, click, and then the lock is closed. And the only thing that happened, the only change in that system was I substituted one image for another image with no technical change behind it. And there were really poor ways to understand what's actually happening and when iconography is meaningful and when it is not. So um, the Chrome team has done a bunch of work at looking at iconography, icons, warnings, how to let people know um, that HTTP is unsafe or less safe than HTTPS. And you know, they are working um, very hard with their extensive um, you know, grasp of how many kind of touch points Chrome has in the world to normalize a bit of a language and, and communicate risk or the lack of safety. But there's absolutely no agreed upon um, language for how this should work. And there's no real consensus about what a lock icon means. So the answer is if you're developing a system is not download a lock icon and stick it somewhere in your app or product or website. The answer is to think, particularly in the context of GDPR changes coming up, about how to meaningfully communicate what your, uh, what your app, what your product is doing. So this is one example that I think shows a way forward. This is in the context of text messaging. So these are screenshots um, taken from an iPhone. And using this very limited visual vocabulary, you get information about how a multiplayer system works. On the iPhone, other iPhones give you blue bubbles. And people that are not on an iPhone, probably Android, give you green bubbles. So if all I have is your phone number and I send you a message from my iPhone, I already know something about you, whether or not you're also using an iPhone. And then a, a second kind of piece of this is using only just a couple of characters here, read in a time, delivered in a time. I am able to understand that all around the world. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It doesn't matter what, what uh, cell carrier you have. It doesn't matter if you're on Wi-Fi. I can start to get this kind, these kinds of information around red receipts. And that actually starts to shape behavior in interesting ways. The screen on the right is from WhatsApp. And one uh, thing that, that WhatsApp does is um, groups can use a convention that show check marks for red receipts. And those pile up um, on the, the right side. Here's a message from my new phone, and there are two check marks indicating two parties have read it. Now, that check mark is a powerful motivator for behavior change. What do I mean by that? I can tell you with a high level of certainty that when I get a WhatsApp message on my phone, I am very careful to just back away. And the reason is I don't want that check next to my name. Because once that check is next to my name, I'm being rude by not responding quicker. But until that check shows up, I have plenty of plausible deniability. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I'm free to kind of just proceed apace. And that, that simple, just few pixels of that check mark is actually a really kind of nice metaphor that we can think about extending to other kinds of domains. Multi-party, multiplayer ways to give some transparency into a system that's actually pretty complicated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about phishing. Phishing is a, is a security basic. And I think that um, the role of UX design in fighting phishing um, should just get more attention. So I'm going to talk about this from a UX point of view and a product design point of view. So phishing is attempting to obtain sensitive information, usernames, password, credit card details, by masquerading as something trustworthy. A lot of the language that we used to talk about um, Phishing is, is very um, loaded, and there's lots of power differentials. People talk about scams run from some kind of the world, or, or um, make fun of the people that are crafting these email messages for their uh, shaky grasp of English or strange language choices. And uh, I want to kind of go to um, a more technical piece of this. So I don't know if we've got any product managers here. This is um, an example of how um, another kind of non-technical discipline, in this case content strategy, actually plays a pretty significant role in protecting people um, from harm. 
So I made up a fictional um, Berlin-based company called Berlin Streetwear. Silicon Alley is, um, I don't know, a concept, a place, a startup language for talking about Berlin. So the URLs that you see at the top, berlinstreetwear.siliconla.com, and the one underneath it um, are very similar. But the one on the bottom is intended to be a spoof with an extra L. So Silicon Alley with, with, the, with the third L. And what that means is by someone sneaking in and getting that third L, it's possible to intercept all of the traffic that's meant for this other site and to put up any kind of whatever you want and extract information from people. And um, in this, the spirit of um, financial transactions, let's imagine another third-party site called EasyPay. Here, here in this middle kind of bank of group, you see three different ways that URL structure um, could be um, accommodated to integrate this hypothetical Berlin streetwear with a hypothetical EasyPay. BerlinStreetwear.com slash EasyPay for payment processing. BerlinStreetwear.EasyPay.com. EasyPay.com slash Berlin Streetwear. Which of those is better? Well, it depends, and um, I think that there are actual security and privacy implications for that choice, and that's a case where you need a bigger people on your, on your team kind of thinking about this and, and giving input into it. Not just um, you know, cryptographers or security engineers, um, but a broader group of people. And I want to just kind of end with these crazy shout outs um, on the marketing side. Um, it's pretty common for companies to use um, email managers that produce these incredibly convoluted um, URLs to uh, track and, and identify people. But there's actually, I'd say, real damage to be done in training people to click on stuff like this where you have really no way of kind of knowing where it goes. And this is all on the, the luxury of a big screen with like plenty of characters or what this might look like on a, on a laptop or desktop. So this gets a lot crazier when you think about mobile. So one of these is a spoof, and one of these is real PayPal. And it's really, really, really hard uh, to tell the difference. So what happens is um, managemyaccount.paypal.com is all of the more characters that you can see here on the left. But if you actually click in the URL bar, that's not the end. It's dash webapps.verifiedcheck.com slash sign up. So that's, that's just, that's phishing. That's just straight up phishing. And it's really, really hard to detect. So there's a, a one-upsmanship, this constant kind of making trickier and trickier things. And uh, it takes a multidisciplinary team to provide uh, defenses against that. And that's not only technical security, there's also user experience content strategy, people deciding what the structure um, of these URLs is going to be. So um, what are some defenses against this? One of them is writing. So in my, um, in my professional life, I'm in the, the process of divesting um, you know, my own um, personal accounts from Google. And, uh, but for the moment, I'm an actual paying customer um, of what is now called the G Suite. So the fact that many people around the world depend on the combination of Drive or Docs or something, but nobody really knows what to call it, I think is pretty telling. So G Suite is the name of the set of things that includes Google's um, online um, shared file editor and um, file sharing solution. So I get these super chipper marketing messages and this nice fresh blue and white looks very kind of Apple-like. Boost team productivity with G Suite business, admin features, protection. And that makes it just sound like kind of a generic business product. But the way in which I actually interact with this thing is in, um, is in the browser. And uh, one of the ways that I've segregated my life is I have a browser of, of the Chrome browser in addition to other browsers, and I'm keeping all of my kind of Google universe inside Chrome. So inside Chrome is how I think of finding these G Suite products, where I think Google Drive lives and where I think that Google Docs live. But inside Chrome, if you get an error, the errors look like this. And aesthetically, this is very like black, white, 
hacker. Um, there's this fun little Easter egg of this kind of um, d dinosaur, I guess, game that you can play when Chrome is, is offline. And my point is not that that on its own is a good decision or a bad decision. I started using Chrome when it was a new product, and I know why this looks like this. My point is that these two things are completely unrelated. It is very, very difficult for me to make any kind of connection between boosting productivity with G Suite business and whatever this like aw snap black message in the browser is. I don't even know what the thing is called. And that's a problem. So when I think about, to use another American example, um, you know, Gmail accounts um, being fished, being spear fished in the case of uh, some of the, the US politicians. Google is kind of uh, training people to just click on random things because there's no consistent written style guide for how they communicate. I don't know how G Suite is supposed to sound and how to look. And that makes it very difficult for me to determine if a link legitimately comes from them or not. So a second um, kind of defense um, against phishing is a visual style guide. And one of the clearest ways to see this, I think, is at the top with the start green. So um, that, that black icon of the, the outline of the phone and the cup with the green circle, many people around the world know that that cup has coffee in it because that is the symbol for Starbucks. And Starbucks has been amazingly successful all around the world on multiple continents, actually getting the right dye on the right paper, no matter who the supplier is, to really own that particular grain, the Pantone 3425C. And that means that with that level of brand recognition and visibility, I have a high level of confidence of whether or not something is actually Starbucks or not. It's easier for me as a, as a consumer to figure out um, if this is like a, a fake knockoff or something of Starbucks. And you know, here at the bottom with these colors, you see some of Simply Secure's style guide. And, and using that with actual, um, with the actual, you know, either hex code or, the, or the, um, the RGB colors, I think matters because once you start getting into just, oh, use the eyedropper or kind of eyeball it, it becomes increasingly easy to, um, to just look sloppy and, and train people to click on anything that looks sort of legitimate. So written style guides and visual style guides are defense um, against phishing, along with content strategy, that's part of how you can stay safe. So these better basics like URLs, style guides, this is well understood stuff. I'm gonna spend a few minutes to talk about how some of this is playing out in some new frontiers. So uh, San Francisco, my city, um, has a, a microphone array over it that listens for gunshots. And um, that's, that's there all the time. It's owned um, by a private company called ShotSpotter. And uh, the shot spotter um, kind of website says that when they hear gunshots, they notify the police. And um, by the way, this is all from Forbes magazine, which is a very kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, pro-capitalism business magazine. You know, this wasn't in like, you know, we don't like the police today. Like this is like Forbes, like kind of asking these questions about like what's going on with, with this microphone array. And I think that these kinds of IoT and smart city applications are pretty powerful for understanding questions of transparency and consent. So if I'm a person in San Francisco, I have no way of knowing that there are microphone arrays listening for what they say are gunshots and what they're actually doing is sending recorded information to the police. And this is done by a private company who's beholden to who? Shareholders? There's no real information about this. So we still have kind of bits of this antiquated infrastructure, like in frequently in Berlin, you'll see like these um, signs that say, you know, you were being video recorded. But I don't, I don't know how you address this at this scale. So what is the equivalent of the check mark and the red receipt for questions like this? It's a really important pressing problem to give some transparency into these systems because currently there is none. And it's a little nuts that uh, companies are recording audio and sending it to the police in the name of crime prevention. Um, so this is an example uh, from uh, some field work I did in New York that uh, specifically I learned about the existence of this DD Perks app. 
So DD Perks is the Dunkin' Donuts loyalty program, and it um, lets you get discounted coffee. So much like, um, say, 10 years ago, businesses might give you a card that they would stamp or punch out, and after you bought 10, you would get one back. Um, well, looking at the, the DD Perks app, there are actually some pretty uh, shockingly detailed features in it in terms of ways it builds a social graph. So in the US, it asks for your location all the time. Of course, they want to know when you're near donuts. They also ask for all of your address book and your contacts, and they ask for everyone you know's birthday. And I don't think that the design team um, that worked on this are diabolical, evil geniuses. I think that they probably started with some um, pretty mundane stories like, you know, it's a cold, snowy day, and you can see that it's like negative 20 in Chicago, so wouldn't it be nice if I could tell someone, hey, there's a hot cup of coffee waiting for you at this place, or on your birthday, you get a free cup of coffee no matter where you are. But the way in which this works is we're, we're handing over incredibly detailed personal data to the Dunkin' Donuts of the world. So to loop back um, to the, the guy that I interviewed in San Francisco about these loyalty programs, um, when you're, just your name is, is you know, not visibly Muslim, just when you are, have no kind of freedom to hide in the sense of having a billing address, in the sense of having your name in these things. We have entrusted the Dunkin' Donuts of the world um, with some pretty personal data. And that's not always the corporation that people think of when we say, hey, what are the corporations doing? So here in Germany, this is the German app permissions. These are much um, lighter, less aggressive app permissions than the US version, um, but that's still you know, pretty surprising. So of course Dunkin' Donuts wants your location. They want to read the contents of your USB. They want to delete the contents of your, your storage. Um, they want to view your Wi-Fi connections, um, prevent the device from sleeping. I think that um, as more people are dependent on their phones for things like um, transportation, um, using, for example, services like Lyft or Uber, um, the risk of, um, of, a, of a bad actor just draining someone's battery um, and leaving them physically stranded and vulnerable is, um, is a threat I am not hearing discussed very much, but I think it's, it's definitely a possibility. And, um, Looping back uh, to the microphone case, um, Alexa is Amazon's voice-based assistant. And um, you know, people have very strong feelings about uh, whether or not there's any possible you know, benefit to in including this kind of, um, you buy a corporate surveillance device and put it in your home. But there are use cases, for example, many people like music, and many people have speakers, and many people find voice a natural way to interact with uh, audio content. But I, I think that um, the absence of a clear language, like the check marks and red receipts, makes it incredibly difficult to figure out what's actually happening with this data. So the official story around these things is, oh, there's only a, a very narrow kind of buffer of audio recorded, and it's just waiting for the wake word. And that buffer is just kind of constantly flowing by, and there's, there's no need for concern. And um, you know, just as someone that's worked in tech for a while that knows what Moore's Law is, I'm not really buying that Amazon doesn't have enough money for more, you know, computing power, like that's what's keeping us safe, like we're betting on Amazon not deciding to invest in slightly more horsepower, um, that doesn't really seem good enough to me. And of course, once you have these things in, in your home, um, Santa Clara County, California, which is um, the headquarters of companies like Google, like Facebook, more than half um, of the, the uh, households in that area speak a language other than English at home, which of course your Alexa is going to know. Um, and I think it, it's worth paying attention to the implications of that kind of information. So from a UX design point of view, I'd like to get those really clear WhatsApp check marks applied to a context like this. There's a misconception when you speak to your Google Now or your Siri or you're holding your phone up. And what I actually think of as like the, the WeChat posture, since short messages have gotten better. There's a misconception that the processing is happening kind of right underneath that microphone on your phone. And that, that's really not how that works. We don't actually know 
where all the steps in the handling are, at what point or if humans are reading it or correcting it or sharing it with peers or indexing it against something else. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in addressing some of those design challenges. Oop, did I miss one? Yes, okay. So um, I used a super commercial example of an Amazon Alexa. And um, you know, I, I get um, a kind of perverse thrill from following the internet of shit on Twitter. But I want to be, uh, be very clear that it, it is not appropriate for us to think about this as only an individual consumer risk. And um, it's not good enough to be all high and mighty and be like, well, if you buy an internet connected tea kettle, then you're a dummy and you deserve what happens to you. Because that's not how the open internet works. And we have seen from things like the Murray botnet that these kinds of, of vulnerabilities can take the sections of the open internet offline. If you like voting, for example, this is your problem. If you are like hardcore entrepreneur and like your mission in life is to get your, your, pro your company up on product hunt and the day comes and you're on product hunt and then, oh rats, you've been DDoSed um, by a botnet, then you're not gonna get a do-over. You're not gonna get a chance to get that kind of, of visibility. There's any piece, if you enjoy reading, writing from independent journalists, if you enjoy getting information about how your city works. It's up to us collectively to uh, address these problems. And, and that means starting to think about some of these hard challenges, like why is it in the production cycle that it's no one's job to make firmware that can be upgraded? Because every month, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, I don't even know the latest statistics of the stuff is being shipped out into the world. And they're going into homes and offices and businesses it's just going to sit until there's some kind of vulnerability discovered. And we are all at risk. It's not, it's not a good enough to be like, you shouldn't have bought that toaster. Someone else's toaster is our problem too now, and we need to work together to do a better job. OK, so that was threat models, better basics, and new frontiers. Just to review, there are many different kinds of threat models, hackers, governments, companies, and stalkers. Which one of those you're worried about depends, and you can design to address those challenges differently. In terms of how to defend against phishing, defend against some of those, um, those actors, two things that you can think about are writing style guides and uh, visual design style guides. That means including UX designers and, and people that might not necessarily have technical security skills. And um, you know, app permissions continue to surprise people, and it's worth asking some hard questions about how to do a better job there. So I will end with a quick commercial. Um, Simply Secure has a knowledge base, um, which is a collection of articles on a bunch of these topics related to design, um, security, and privacy, and coming at it from a bunch of points of view. And uh, I welcome your feedback on what's missing here. So we have to make some hard decisions about which pieces of content, new content, we produce in 2018. And it's very helpful for me and my colleagues to hear that you came to this expecting to see, and it wasn't there. I can, I can uh, move that up the stack. So with that, I'll say um, thank you. We have a Slack channel. Um, if you're interested in these kinds of conversations, I'm also available on Twitter. That's my real email address. And uh, thank you all.